All right, I'm going to pray, hey? Kick it off with some prayer and we'll get into it. That's a pretty hectic passage. Woman bleeding for 12 years, healed, and young girl raised from the dead. So let's pray uh, and ask God to help us understand what he wants us to get from this, eh? Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord. That means you're a God who reveals himself to be known. And so, Father, we just pray tonight that you will help us to understand you and your love for us even more. Um, Help us to understand what it looks like to come into a good relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to actually... Yesterday came up with a game. I think it's a very good game. It's quite intellectual. It's called Imagine. And before I start it, I want to tell you something, apart from how good that graphic is. I'm going to tell you that you've got to tell me if this is weird. My daughter, Maya, she's five years old. That's not the weird part. She's five years old. And I saw her on YouTube the other day, which I didn't know she could get onto. And she's watching something. And do you know what she absolutely loves to watch now? She does, actually, but not Bluey, yeah. (laughs) Strongman competitions. (laughs) Now, I'm going to back this up because that's weird, right? Sort of. But her second favourite Marvel uh, person, you're going to throw things at me now, is Hulk. So I reckon she just sees a whole bunch of Hulks doing all these things. She's like, this is Marvel. It's (laughs) It's a long episode, but it's a good one. Anyway, we're going to play a game. It's called Imagine. What's going to happen is, soon, you're going to shut your eyes. And then I'm going to say, imagine, I'm going to tell you something, put a picture in your head, you've got to think it, what what does that look like? And then when your eyes are shut, the guys at the back are going to put a picture on the screen of what I said, and then I'll say, open your eyes, look at the picture, and see if it was what you imagined, how close you were, okay? Very good game. You can take this one home, okay? All right, shut your eyes. And for the first one, Don't open until I say, I actually want you to imagine what a strong man looks like. So think about Maya's favourite show, strong man competition, what does a strong man look like? All right, three, two, one, open. (laughs) Who was way off? Yep, it's not something to be unashamed, no, that's fine. All right, all right, next one. All right, we're going to go imagine. Imagine, shut your eyes and imagine what a really wealthy man looks like. Really wealthy man. I wonder what picture that puts in in your head, what you're kind of thinking of that will show someone's wealthy. Three, two, one, go. (laughs) Who went Lamborghinis and like gold chains and money and, yep, there you go, a couple. There you go, Elon Musk, 300 and something billion or something, I don't know. You don't earn that in youth work, so I've got no idea. All right, here we go. Got a couple more. Shut your eyes and imagine. If I said to you to imagine a world champion athlete, what that would look like, who that would look like, I wonder what you would think, what sport, how fit, what gender. Here we go. In three seconds, I'll tell you to open your eyes. Three, two, one, open. Did anyone actually think Ash Barty? What? Yes, good work. <clears throat> Go to Luke Jardine and get some sort of prize at the end. Because <clears throat> I don't have any. But she's the Ipswich girl as well. How good is that? Ipswich girl, beautiful. There you go. So Ash Barty. Here's the last one we're going to do, all right? Last one. <clears throat> I want you to imagine, this one's a tougher one now. I want you to think of someone, imagine someone, if I said, this person's really close to God. Like, what the heck? What does that look like? Have a think, imagine. I wonder what makes you think someone's close to God. All right, three, two, one, look. (laughs) All right. All right, get it, definitely get that off now. Definitely get, chuck that one off. There you go, awesome. So good. I'm actually really interested. I'd love to know later on what you thought of, what things came to mind when I actually, when I said that. And the reason I say it is because in this passage tonight, 
in Jesus' time around 2,000 years ago, it wasn't uncommon to have really religious people in the street praying really loudly, proudly and boldly in the street, and others would look at them and surely they're thinking, you know, surely that's what looking godly is like. And you know, people in the marketplace as well, religious people in the marketplace giving to the poor and doing it so others can see them do it as well. Look at the good deeds for the sake of God, you know. People or crowds are watching and probably going, surely that's a godly thing to do as well. And there would have been people as well who love God's commands and talk about them all the time and look like they're following all his commands. In fact, they chuck some of their own commands in there as well and point out all the people who can't uphold these commands. Surely crowds looked at these religious people and said, that must be what it looks like to be close to God. So just before this passage tonight, the one we're about to get into, Jesus is actually being challenged by some of these religious people I was just talking about. They're actually hitting him up, and they're hitting him up because whatever he's doing is different to what they're doing. And they hit him up, and they're asking him, why are you not like us? Why are you not doing the things we're doing, these religious things? Why are you not? And the reason is, we find this out, the reason is because he's come to do something new. See, people had all kinds of ideas in their head of what it looked like to please God. And maybe we still do today as well. But tonight, I'm going to steal Luke's thing that he said at church on Sunday. We see here tonight that Jesus flips the script on that thinking. Now, the story we're looking at, it's actually in three places in the Bible. So it's in Matthew, it's in Luke, and it's in Mark's Gospel. And Matthew does something really interesting here. He massively shortens it down. So he shortens down this story of what he's telling, shorter than what other people, how they told the story, and he does it for a reason. He's left a bunch of details out of this story because Matthew's actually really massively zooming in on something here, and he wants you to get it tonight. He wants us to focus on who Jesus is, what he's come to do. And why this news is more important than anything else in your life. So let's zoom in. We're going to jump in with him. We've got a slide coming up on the screen here. Verse 18. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died. But come and put your hand on her and she will live. What a hectic thing to say to someone. So the first person we actually meet in this story, this true event that happened, is this religious fella, like I was talking about. And he's a synagogue leader. Actually, in another part of the Bible, we're told his name. It's Jairus. And see, a synagogue, it's like a gathering. It means gathering. It's a place where Jewish people would come together and they'd do all kinds of things there. There was court proceedings and events. And then they'd do something quite a lot, and that was worship as well. So they'd pull out old scrolls and unravel them and they'd learn from them. They'd learn about God's law that he gave to Moses for his people. And they'd pull out other scrolls and they'd learn about prophets. That's people God chose to speak through to make himself known. They would do this stuff. And see, Jesus wasn't popular with a lot of these people that attended the synagogue. See, Jesus had made some massive claims recently Things like he could forgive sins. The stuff he's talking about is actually pointing to himself. He's actually saying some things that are starting to sound like he's God. And he was doing miracles to back it up as well. The other thing was a crowd had started to come around him. He's saying things that makes it look like he's God. He's doing miracles. Crowds are coming around him. People are questioning old ways. And so the synagogue leaders, they see Jesus and they see him as an enemy. But then in the start of the story, we see one of them, this guy Jairus. And he's going through one of the, I can't imagine it. I've got a picture of my daughter up on the screen before. I can't imagine it. It's got to be one of the most soul-crushing, hard, flattening experiences that life could throw at you. His little girl, his little princess, has just died. 
and she's 12 years old. Now, I shared a bit before about working in youth detention, if that picture comes up. Um, Running workshops with young guys, in sections, doing church services, helping find employment on the outside with the support of the local church. And something really interesting about Juvie, you may not think about it, when you go in there as a worker even, it's like you're cut off from the outside world. So I'm not allowed to take my phone in. If you have a smartwatch on at the front gate, they'll take that away from you. You'll have to lock that up. You can't take anything in that'll connect you with the outside world. And so one day, I'm running a program in youth detention and a guard comes in and he says, Nathan, you've got, to come, you've got to come out with me for a sec. So I don't know what you guys are like. I don't know if there's a guilty conscience, but whenever I get pulled out of a classroom, I always think I've done something wrong. So I'm like, what the heck is going on? What have I said? I'm, always, I'm almost saying sorry already. But he pulls me out of the room and he says to me, in like the shortest amount of words, he says to me, your wife rang, your daughter's in hospital, you have to go right now. And that was all I got. And I remember my brain switching off, survival mode, packed my bag and started just to walk out the gate, not even knowing what I was walking into, not even knowing what's wrong with her, not even knowing will I see her again, not knowing any of this stuff at all. And the thing I want to make a point of here is when I left that section and went to my car, if there was a fella there with like a bag full of money, like 10 million bucks, and if that guy said to me, hey, Nathan, stop for 30 minutes and I'll give you all this money. Like, I know you want to see your daughter, but just hang around for 30 minutes and I'll give you $10 million. Like, 10 million bucks for a youth worker too. Like, that's amazing. You know, that's incredible. But there's no chance that I would have waited 30 minutes for that money. There's no chance I would have done that. And I think that happens in times of trauma, when we get hit by heavy news, maybe you've experienced that yourself. At those times, I reckon we really see what's truly important in life. What is valuable. So this fellow Jairus, he is broken right now. And see, for him to approach Jesus here to seek some kind of help, He's going to lose a lot. What do I mean by that? He's going to lose the respect of his mates. He's going to lose his job at the synagogue. He's going to lose his place in his community. In fact, it might even feel like he's just going to lose his livelihood. If he does this and comes to Christ, how much has he got to lose? Coming to Jesus is going to cost Jairus a lot. But see, as a synagogue leader, with Jesus doing this stuff and all the the regions around, these miracles happening, he would have been one of the first to hear about it as well. He's heard what Jesus is doing. He's heard that Jesus has driven out evil spirits. He's He's healed people instantly who are sick. He's calmed storms. And so we see Jairus, he makes his decision. He comes to Jesus. Not as a man proud of his achievements or worthy of God's love. No, he, he massively humbles himself. In fact, the words may not be up there yet. The words said before that he kneels down. In other words, he drops to his knees. In, in reverence, in worship, whatever words you want to put in there, he drops to his knees and he manages to get these words out. He says, my daughter has just died. But come and put your hand on her and she will live. Now, I wonder what Jesus' response was going to be. I wonder what Jairus thought, because people like Jairus, they'd been hating on Jesus. You know, they'd been saying, like, they'd been pushing back on what he's doing, and now one of them comes to Jesus and says, please, will you help me? Please, will you raise my daughter? So what does Jesus do when someone who's been pushing back on him, hating on him, comes to him? He responds with compassion. Jesus gets up, doesn't he? He gets up and he goes with Jairus to his house. Now, that's a hectic story, like if it ended there. But along the way, there's an interruption. See, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. 
She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. I don't, need oh, don't get scared. I'm going to ask if there's any 12-year-olds in the room. You're not going to come up. Right? Yeah, where? There you go. All right. I'm going to talk about you guys later on. No, I'll do it now. She's been bleeding for 12 years. That's like you guys bleeding every day of your life since you were born. That's a long time. I know in soccer, I've bled for like the whole game and I thought that was too much. You know what I mean? Like kicked in the knee or something. 12 years she's been bleeding for, in pain, every day. And see, this condition that this lady has, the thing is, she's not like Joyce. We don't have her name. We know nothing about her. But this condition that she has, it doesn't just destroy her physically and it doesn't just destroy her mentally, but it also massively destroys her social life. This woman is not part of community like Jairus. Now, I don't know if you've been left out before, but even if you get left out once, you know that feeling, hey, when you've been left out. You know that feeling inside. This woman has been left out for ages. People want nothing to do with her. And we don't read it here, but in other parts of the Bible where we hear this story, we know this woman is desperate. She has been to every doctor in town. In fact, it says she's broke. She spent all of her money on the doctors in town trying to find someone who could heal her, but nothing. She's the kind of person you might walk past in the mall in Queen Street and avoid eye contact with. She's alone in her suffering. The other thing is that this lady's been classed as unclean. So what that means is anything she sits on, anything she brushes up against, anything she touches, any one she touches, is deemed unclean. So if another human touches her, they've got to then leave community and do all these purification rituals until they're allowed to come back. This lady has absolutely nothing to offer Jesus. And in her shame, she's not even going to make Jesus talk to her, but she's heard that he's been showing compassion to lowly like her. In fact, it's reported that he's a man with authority. Like he can make sick people healthy instantly. And she believes if she can just touch his cloak from behind, that'll be enough. She could be free from 12 years of slavery to sickness. So what happens, verse 22, Jesus turned and saw her and said, take heart, daughter. He said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. I wonder, this may not be for everyone. Maybe it is for some here. But I wonder if there's a time in your life, and it could be right now, where you feel so low. Maybe so unworthy. Or this one so unclean. Maybe you struggle with the idea that God would want anything to do with you. It's huge. I just want to pack this really quickly, pull three things out of this one verse. I'm going to put them up on the screen just to get out of this because I don't think we should go past it without doing it. Number one is, Jesus took what made this lady unclean upon himself and then he freed her from that identity. Jesus made the unclean lady clean. Number two, he didn't do it because she earned it or because of her achievements in life. No, he said it was because of her faith. And number three, he gives her a a new name. So the people in that crowd know her as the unclean lady probably and they've heard Jesus say loudly for others to hear, what's he call her? daughter new name <clears throat> now I actually as I was reading this and as I was thinking about it it brought up a real story of a mate of mine who was hurt by others when he was younger and it was a pain that shaped him for many years and he said one day he went to this church service wasn't really into church but went along to this church service and he heard a pastor up front preaching about the time Jesus was baptized 
So it's a little bit earlier on in, the, in Scripture. Jesus is baptised. And when you read that bit of Scripture, you read that God speaks. And so God says at that time, this is my son who I love. With him I'm well pleased. So God speaks that as Jesus is baptised. And the preacher said, and he looked into the audience and he looked at my mate. My mate said I've got eye contact with him. And the preacher actually said, I hope you realise this as well, that when you place your faith in Jesus, that you too, you're brought into God's family. And those words that God's speaking to his son are for you as well. And so for my mate, That was a powerful message. That was a life-changing message. He felt like he had a new identity. He felt loved, the name a son, and no longer shaped by man's actions. He was now a new creation. I love that. By faith alone, we're brought into God's family where we experience his forgiveness and his blessing. All right. This photo, this is another weird photo. Um, that fella, no one knows who he is, hey? I mean, you know me, but no one has... Anyone want to have one guess? Yeah, good one, Terry. That's the best guess so far. So, that guy's name is KRS-One. He was in the... set. Yeah, get ready. I get excited over this, all right? In the 70s, in the Bronx, he was there when the hip-hop burst. So hip-hop hasn't been around since Adam and Eve, you know what I mean? Like, it actually started later on, and it was in the 70s, and it was in the Bronx, and this guy came along, and he had all these bouncers with him with earpieces like this, and we were in Brown's Plains, I'd never seen anything like it. He spoke for four hours, and it was hectic, it was huge. I got a photo with him, and it's almost like I was just pointing at him. <laughs> I was like, it's, it's him. Like, yeah, exactly like that, yeah, like point at Alicia, yeah. You know, it's Alicia. She knows everything about hip-hop. No, it's him. He, this is hip-hop. Everything, you know, like everything points to this guy here. And see, I reckon, the reason I say that is I reckon Jairus is starting to see this now. You know, everything they read in the scrolls, in the synagogue, starting to point to this Jesus fella. You know, the law that God gave his people, which we fail to live up to, the law shows that we're sinful, and that we're deserving of God's judgment, and God promised, he's promised to send one, his prophet spoke about it, who would come and save us from this judgment. And I reckon Jairus has seen all this stuff in scripture that he's read about pointing to this person, Jesus. Now I'm sure Jairus, he's just hanging out to go to his daughter. Obviously he probably is pulling Jesus by the cloak himself, but how confident would he be now? You know, he just witnessed himself that Jesus really does have authority like he heard. He has authority over sickness. This woman, 12 years, she's healed instantly. And this fella's looking like the one God promised. And so the story continues. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw this noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. This girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. When I was a kid, one of my favourite rappers had this song in his line and it said, I never sleep because sleep is the cousin of death. I was pretty young. I don't think I slept for a week after reading that line, eh? <laughs> like that. I probably even wet the bed for a few nights after too. Like that's that's crap. I never sleep because sleep is the cousin of death. Yeah, I don't really know what that means still. It's been a long time. But, but the reason I say it is because it actually got me thinking at a young age about death. This hip-hop line, I was like, what's he saying? What's it mean? What's it look like? And the point I make here is I reckon in our culture, I reckon we pretty much believe that, you know, you live while you live. That whole YOLO, I don't even know that's still around. I'm getting old. You only live once. You live while you live. But then when you die, that's it. You know, death's the end of life, and, and after that, there's no more. But the Bible paints a very different picture to that. See, when Jesus gets to Jairus' house, there's this crowd of mourners playing musical instruments and wailing in the street. Now, we may not get this, 
when, when someone died, especially if you had money, you'd pay for these people to come to your house and start making noise, playing instruments, crying. Others would hear about it. They would join you in your mourning as well. So there's this crowd here, and they're doing that, professional mourners. Now, I hope these fellas got paid up front because Jesus was about to show everyone <laughs> that his authority extends further than sickness. You know, he tells the crowd to go away because he says the girl was not dead but asleep. And they laughed at him because it's clear she's dead. I mean, they're making lots of noise and she's not moving. I'm from Kalanga. We have so many parties in my street <laughs> during, the, no- during you know, the week. I love, I love where I live. But if there's bass playing next door, I'm not going to sleep, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't lay down. This girl's dead. She's not moving. But then Jesus walks in. He takes the little girl by the hand and she gets up. And when people see this, we see that what it says is they quickly, they start running and telling everyone in the region what they saw. This Jesus fella healed her, that, yeah, you know, unclean, and then lifted up Jairus' daughter from the dead. They told everyone, and 2,000 years later, that story's still ringing out because we're hearing it right now. <clears throat> if you read this story, and if you, you come away with this final message, you know that <clears throat> Jesus will heal your every sickness if you have great faith. Jesus will heal everything going on in your life if you have great faith. If that's your takeaway from this, then you've missed the point. It's not saying that at all. I stand here as a diabetic. Like I inject like eight needles a day. I've been doing that for about oh, it's like 22 years or something. You know, others in the Bible ask God to take pain away from them and, and, and he does it sometimes and other times he doesn't. I watched this video on YouTube. It's a church in America. It's this old fellow on stage always talking about healing. God will heal everything. White hair. He's probably like 70s. He's got glasses on and he's talking about people being raised out of wheelchairs. And in our church, everything, everyone gets healed. And then I read the comments and then someone said, I find it really hard to, to believe that when old mates got specs on on stage. <laughs> like, maybe after getting that person out of the wheelchair, ask for your eyes to be fixed. Like, <laughs> See, miracles, they do happen. Miracles do happen. I've seen them. I've seen one this last month of a lady, a friend of mine who had cancer and goes back to the doctor, and the doctor literally said, I cannot explain. You should, you should be gone. I cannot explain. Not just, oh, it was there, now it's not. I can't explain. There was prayer circles around her. There was lots of people praying and seeking God to heal. But on the flip side as well, I've also lost beautiful family, strong faith as well, who have lost the battle with their sickness. See, it's not saying that Jesus is going to heal everything in that way. The point of the miracles is to draw our attention to Jesus and to make us ask the question here, who is he? And what tonight's passage is doing, it's it's magnifying Jesus and showing that he has all authority over disasters, over demons, over disease, and over death. In fact, Jesus says it at the end of Matthew's gospel. He's died on the cross. He's rose again. His disciples see him. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came, I mean, he's raised. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. <clears throat> I'm going I'm to finish up here and just say, you know, when we read this passage, our lives may not look like Jairus, or they may not look like the unclean lady at the start there. They might look very different. But what we need to understand is that like them, we have the exact great need. Like Jairus, like his daughter, and like the woman in the story, we have the exact need that they have, and that is to be rescued from the curse of sin and death, which is inescapable when left up alone to us. But see, Jesus, who went to the cross to pay the debt for our sin, 
who rose again, truly showing that he has got authority over everything, including death, we read that Jesus will set free those who place their faith in him as their Lord and Saviour. For God showed his love in this way that he sent his only son, you may have heard this one, that whoever believes will not perish, but have eternal life. So if I was to ask you, don't do it, you don't have to do it, but if I was to ask you to shut your eyes again and to, and to imagine, think, you know, what does it look like, someone close to God, what does that person look like? Now, it wouldn't be this picture of a proud and confident and, and a person doing, following all these rules and doing all these things. It would be a picture of someone on a journey who knows that they're a sinner and only by faith in Jesus can they be set free. That's my question to you tonight. Is that you here tonight? As you hear that, can you feel that? Can you feel that on your heart? Maybe you're feeling tonight it's time to ask God to make himself known to you. Well, I want to finish on this. I'm going to I sing to my daughter every night. I call it singing. I'm not sure if she would, but I sing to her every night. We're going to read some lyrics of a song that you're singing here in church on Sundays. Um, and then we're going to pray. Should have made that bigger, hey? Anyway. So now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse on sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, I was free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise and honour unto thee. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, that you want to be known. And we thank you, Lord, that you give us your word, the Bible, so that we can read it and learn about you. As we read it tonight, Lord, maybe there's ideas in our head of what it looks like to come to you, Lord, or being so unclean there's no chance we could, or anything like that, Lord. But I thank you of these examples of people who came to you by faith and brought into your family. To be saved, Lord, from the curse of sin and death. And so, Lord, I pray tonight, maybe there's people sitting here, Lord, that hear that, and they, and, and they want to know more about that, or maybe they hear that and they want that. Father, I pray that you hear the prayers tonight, seeking you out to make yourself known to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. Uh, like and subscribe to support our channel. And uh, if you want to know more about us, you can watch some of our other videos or hit us up if you want to learn more about God.